Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Chris Merla. Chris is the Managing Director of Coal Hill Ventures and the Robotics Hub. Uh, Chris, welcome to the pod. Yeah, glad to finally be here. Glad to finally have you on, buddy. Yeah, it's been a while. (laughs) Absolutely. So for people listening, Chris and I met at NREC years ago when I was interviewing for a job in Chris's office. Yeah. He was a comm spec, which is a commercial specialist. Were you? No, I was (laughs) the Associate Director for New Ventures. Right. Uh, (laughs) right. Which was... Yeah, so, I mean, semi-similar. Uh, um, and at the time was, you know, given actually a very thankful degree of latitude to work on what is now my business. Nice. So, I mean, met a lot of great people, you know, yourself included. Thanks. You too, buddy. Yeah. And uh, it's a really cool time to work there because, I mean, this was, you know, back before people started leaving to start venture funds and self-driving car companies, successful or not. and random other stuff. <laughs> so it was a really, you know, really cool time to have a lot of very interesting people in the same proximity, most of which liked each other and work on some cool stuff, get some cool ideas going. And, you know, obviously I don't think our current business would exist in its current form as well without that time. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really cool. So I guess, I mean, this is a good time to segue into the next one. Like, so how do you, start a venture fund. I mean, that is not something most people end up doing. Um, how do you go about it? What made you decide to do it? Um, lessons learned, things you would do differently if you could do it all over again. Yeah, it was a non-traditional life choice. So certainly starting a venture fund is a bit different than starting a company because you know, for the most part, the kind of people willing to fund new companies, there's a lot of them. So if you have a good pedigree and a good idea, the fundraising cycle is fairly straightforward. You know, if you are trying to raise a venture fund, you have to simultaneously prove you can operate companies well and invest in companies well. And that's, you know, less straightforward. And especially when you do like what we're doing, which is back companies before they exist up until the point at which they actually are fairly tangible. uh, It's a lot of asking people to go on faith to back your company. So, you know, thankfully had, you know, a lot of time to work on relationships and work on the model and actually prove we were different. And, you know, about eight to nine years into it now, we're actually looking like we're pretty good at this, have two very good venture funds. And um, it's a little less obtuse to go out and raise and, you know, do the core, you know, the kind of core parts of the, you know, business that we quite frankly didn't we had, there's no way to prepare for until you actually do it yeah it makes a lot of sense yeah you know unlike a company where people are kind of saying well we're going to pick 20 of these and it's okay if a couple of them are terrible so we'll take a risk um on a good concept with good people you know it's a lot more i would say work proving that you actually are differentiated up front that you're capable up front because of course you know, it's a 10 year journey with us. So you have to really bring people to the point at which they're comfortable taking that entire journey with you before kind of day one. And, you know, it's not like, let's say going out and trying to raise like a mutual fund or raise money for later stage companies where you can show, um, very tangible things. I mean, data. Yeah. On the company, you know, and, and we can now that we've been doing this for a while, show that retrospectively. And of course the data is fantastic. So that helps. But when you're just starting, you're saying, well, I'm a guy. Um, you've probably never heard of me. Here are my partners. You've probably never heard of them either. We all have really good backgrounds. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have this really strong opinion that doing deep tech in a kind of ethical fashion is good for financial returns. And here's why we think that. And we're going to go invest in a bunch of companies that uh, don't currently exist. And at the time at which... We invest in them. 
will typically have in, existed for less than six months. Um, that part of the storytelling is a little bit more complicated than let's say, well, here's my pitch for why this company is the next greatest thing and we're going to win tech, you know, tech crunch disrupt and change the world. Um, and making the world a better place. Making the world better. Place. <laughs> <And> I, <laughs> thank you, Silicon Valley season one. Yeah. You know, so it's in some ways good for the business because it makes you actually, I mean, just to be blunt, get your crap together quicker. Um, it makes you think about your assumptions more rigorously and really, you know, come down to it. Because unlike a, a startup where, I mean, primarily you're, risking your own time like now we're risking our time we're risking our compensation and we're risking other people's money you know there's a lot more i mean not to sound like yoda but you have to take a serious mind um and you really have to kind of think through your stuff and that's one a challenge but two hopefully good for the business eventually and i think at least in our case it was yeah it makes a lot of sense well it also sounds like i mean you build up trust over time. So, I mean, you've got eight to 10 years doing this and I mean, similar, I've got eight years into SKA now. Um, and we've got bigger and better clients, the further we, not bigger and better, but bigger clients, the further we go. Yeah. I think we're like a whole six months older than you guys. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, um, no, actually all the way around. Right. Cause you had started this before we left, right? Maybe I, I started quite soon after you and I met, like, I think I was looking for a job at NRAC and a few other places. I couldn't find a place I wanted to work. And I, I just ended up saying, you know, screw it. I'll start my own thing. And so, I mean, I I'd wanted to do it for a while. Like I had somebody designing the logo art while I was at joy global. And yeah. so, yeah, you know, I was kind of staging for it anyway, but you know, I mean that, you know, leap of faith, I guess of, you know, well, I'm just going to make my own money instead of taking a salary is, is pretty difficult. I think to stomach, yeah. easier when you don't have kids. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, uh, I mean, you, I started the business in the hospital. Like I literally incorporated the business in the hospital. One of my kids were born in, um, a miles or yeah. Nice. Yeah. So miles a good, good yeah, he's a fun dude. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the incorporation date of Cole Hill and miles's birthday are within a week of each other. That's awesome. You know, um, so there's that, but I mean, we also, I mean, thankfully, when we by the time we actually got to quitting our jobs and working the business full time, we had sponsorship money that we had raised before we left and things like that. So it was a little easier for us. But yeah, also it sounds kind of almost similar. Like you wanted to do it anyway. You were staging it. You were getting ready while you had you know the shelter of NREC and yeah, I mean, or working somewhere. Well, no, I mean, I, I, they gave me time to work. You know, take uh, get an MBA from Carnegie Mellon while I worked there, which a good chunk of the current business was worked under. Um, very supportive bosses because you know one of the things both uh, my direct supervisor Steve D'Antonio and some of the other senior guys at the center sort of realized before they hired me at least I think was <laughs> that there weren't a lot of venture funds that really approached really hard technology well and certainly that's I think beneficial to a lot of people in town in the larger ecosystem that a fund that's actually good at that exists. So, you know, people can fund innovations very well. Yeah. But people are absolutely terrible at funding inventions. And what we wanted to do was sort of provide help to the other side of the coin, right? We're looking for people and things that have already, you know, have already accomplished something very hard technically, you know, deep technology, deep patents, um, really experienced founding teams. But I mean, they're not trying to make an app, right? Like we like to back people that are doing something like, again, walking robots or precision medicine or, <laughs> you know, literal super suits. Yeah. I and, know you're talking about with all those, by yeah, the way. Um, not all, I mean, all have been all three incredibly of fun journeys to date. Yeah. <laughs> But those are not things, you know, it's not DoorDash, right? You're not saying yeah. that I'm going to do this Can commodity. Can I say the names of the companies or is that? Well, as a reference to agility, aeroptures, medicine, and seismic. There you go. So, you know. <laughs> get, get awesome it. companies. Check yes. them out. Yeah. 
No, nah, all, all tremendous fun to work with. But, you know, they, they're doing real hard things and doing them well. Yeah. And I'd like to think that getting those sorts of companies to a scale where they can be viewed financially, viewed like a established company, I mean, it's very different from trying to, again, start like Uber or DoorDash or some sort of very easy tech, hard marketing challenge. You know, in, in each of those cases, you know, the products, I mean, if they exist in sufficient form, they need to be adopted. None of those things are doing things that you can afford not to adopt technology when it exists. But getting the technology to exist in productized form is, you know, s- tremendously harder yeah. than trying to, again, build your social network or, <laughs> you know, what have you. <laughs> so, you know, how you approach those companies, I think, is a little bit more like blues and a little less like rock and roll. Oh, that's right? interesting. It's, you know, hitting the right notes at the right time and giving, you know, very smart, very capable people the patience and the space they need to actually build stuff of value versus, you know, build, 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 sell, 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 uh, and make it work at some point and, you Let's know, make, make it, it pro- <laughs> right. And then like make it profitable, like five years later, hopefully fingers crossed, but yeah. let's burn money in the meantime. And it's cheap enough to make these apps that we can just afford to fail on most of them and just crank well, them out. I mean, that and like, you know, I mean, you know, we're in a garage with all these cool robots around us. Yeah. Like if, the latest app on your phone is just terrible. You know, there will be three updates every hour for the next set 36 hours until it actually doesn't suck. If that robot, you know, is God awful when you put it out into the, you know, into the marketplace, it's going to be God awful forever. Yeah. It's going to be God awful at least six months until you can build a new robot. Like, you know, you you can push over the air updates, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that's only if it's a software problem. Right, like you can't push over the air update. it throws its left track when turned, <laughs> you can't fix software that update yet. is not going to fix that. Yep. So, you know, you kind of got to make sure that you're at least pretty darn close to the bullseye before you actually release the product. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's sort of just like kind of that, you know, new venture fund kind of analogy you made earlier it's a lot more scrutiny and it's a lot more work. And it's one of those things where like at the end of the day, that's probably a good thing, right? You had to think more, usually good, right? <laughs> like when it's kind of a moat to your competition, right? I mean, if, well, when it's a moat to competition, but even if it's not like, you know, being forced to think things through before you do something is not a horrible fate. Yep. I agree. Right. So, uh, that's sort of, how we've kind of built our approach and it's been a lot of fun, you know, and I think hopefully it's been actually pretty good for the people we work with. Um, I think at least most of them would say that. So can't complain. That's awesome. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, it's been fun working with you over the years and watching some of the awesome companies you invest in and, you know, I I enjoy our friendship as well. And so uh, thanks buddy. (laughs) And so, yeah, no, it's interesting to hear about your thesis in this context. Cause I feel like there's a lot of people I've known for years, but then when I interview them, I hear a different perspective than I would get normally from talking to them. So, right. yeah, it's fun. Well, I try to be, you know, very similar whether I'm on the camera or not. And hopefully um, what I'm saying now isn't too different. from. Well, what we I mean, thought. nothing's a shock, but yeah. just hearing your perspective on, you know, blues versus rock and roll. That's something we've never talked about before, but, but I agree with it. I, yeah. I can understand it i think it applies to some of the technical work we do as well yeah you know it's you can't there's no formula for making any type of robot like they're all different and require skill and consideration and thought and intention and uh i mean systems engineering is a great discipline for that reason because it's just thinking through you know all the stuff that your robot's got to do and how it's got to do it and then communicating that to other engineering disciplines and so it's got to actually work together right yeah i mean it's you know arguably the heart of robotics. Yeah, exactly. Now, granted, I think we're two systems engineers by thought, so that probably... Um, Bit of an echo chamber. Yeah. <laughs> Find some Kool-Aid for us to drink real quick. Um, I got brandy. Yeah, there you go. Cheers. <laughs> I 
But yeah, I mean, so who are you watching these days? Like what companies seem like they're doing interesting stuff than you, to you, um, maybe like outside the portfolio? Well, I mean, you know, we usually don't talk about a company to invest in it because, okay. you know, one, we're usually working with companies before they actually really formally exist. Understood. Um, and likewise, we don't really want to either flag that something, you know, flag an investment that someone else can scoop us on before we make it. Yeah, or makes sense. on the other hand, talk about a company and then not invest in them. And then people are like, you know, what's up? Yeah, it makes but sense. But I think in terms of uh, themes, you know, we had a pretty heavily industrial slant there for a while, a couple of very good, you know, medical companies. And where those two industries sort of meet, kind of helping people be, you know, less fragile, more productive and happier is where a lot of, I think, the most interesting con- concepts in automation and robotics are right now. Yeah. You know, you know, sufficiently advanced AI too, um, whether it's, you know, restoring function loss because, you know, you can't see or can't you know, move as well as you used to, whether it's preventing hard front injuries like soft tissue injuries that, you know, exoskeletons largely have bypassed. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, we really get interested in because if it's an easy problem that just requires the right amount of sales focus, I mean, there's plenty of venture capitalists on the planet that can do that well. That's not our thing. Like what we like to find is something that could be, I mean, really, really tangible within two years given sufficient funding, but it is entirely non-trivial and non-obvious that that could occur. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I think if you go back to all the companies we talked about, all the ones we've done, you know, that's both where they've been when we've invested, but also where they've gotten to an overwhelming majority of the time, which has been fun. So... To maybe ask the question a different way, um, or a different question entirely, rather. Yeah. Um, how did you get introduced to the guys at Agility? Like, how did that how did that go down? How did you get in there? Like, how did you and Damien connect initially? And um, how did that relationship build, if you're comfortable talking about it? I want to say it was indirectly through the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Cool. Um, you know, I think we both had CMU ties at the time. And what became, you know, agility didn't have arms yet. So it hadn't, um, it didn't get entered in the full DRC competition, but it was this, you know, wonderful little robot chicken with, you know, great legs, no upper torso. (laughs) And it did the mobility part of the challenge that, like, I mean, you will not see Cassie, the precursor to their current product. Anywhere on those DRC fail YouTube videos where robots are hilariously trying to like turn a doorknob and then fall over or like literally can't walk on a sidewalk. Uh, it was incredibly robust. You know, and Damien was a sharp dude that had actually been successful to the company previously. You know, Jonathan was a tenured professor at Oregon State and like they clearly took an intelligent approach to how they built their company up front. Like the IP, the stuff that didn't exist was all, you know, thought through very well and thorough. And it was a pleasure working with them for a while before we got to a point in which we can invest because I mean, they were, they were technically very good, just good dudes and really thought through, you know, the human factors of what their business was going to encounter three years in before it existed. That's awesome. You know, and if you, you go with like, you know, Dave, Jessica and Tori at Ariel or, um, you know, Rob and, you know, Mike and Ryan at Seismic, like it is similar stories across the board. Like we find people that have really, really ambitious stuff are fun to work with. Give a bleep about the actual people they're eventually going to serve as technologists and, you know, really want to close that gap quickly and well. Yeah. And, you know, it's why our job's fun because, like, more often than not, you see those people succeed. And when they succeed, it's 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 big, you know? Yeah. So. 
No, that's awesome. I mean, it's it's interesting when you find somebody um, really, really talented that you have alignment with. I mean, I guess I do that in the um, talent acquisition space. Like, just finding people yeah. to work on SK as engineering teams is, I don't know if it's the entirely analogous, but I feel like it's my closest analog I got, so I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had the pleasure with working with a lot of good people over the years. It sounds like your approach is similar, which is, you meet somebody, you know, through circumstance who is has good vision, has the ability to follow through on it, foresight, responsibility, um, intelligence, um, yeah. experience, and then you kind of bet on people. Yeah, I mean, you know, you start with people on the both end, right? You know, you're the people that are actually going to build the company, and, of course, the people they're going to serve, and you see how well they connect. And um, more often than not, they connect well. And when they do, it's, again, it's, just, it's really fun. Because um, on one hand, it's like you're seeing all these people you've sort of helped for years realize sort of their vision. But then, of course, you're also seeing this other population, which are the customers, which, and at least in our cases, have had some screaming problem they can't actually address at all. And now there's a solution where previously it was just, well, get injured in 10 years. <laughs> or, you know. So uh, that's the best we got. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, well, take eight aspirin when you leave ARC. Like, it, sorry, uh, and we have a, we have a very good disability plan, or <laughs> um, you know, in in the medical front, like, it's just, I mean, people can't figure out what's wrong with them until it's too late, and that's tragic. Yeah. So, you know, you look across those spectrums, preventing people from getting injured, um, keeping people working well into their old age, and keeping people healthy when you actually could diagnose what's wrong with them if you just had an AI and a doctor working together. Um, it's all really rewarding stuff. And um, seeing it from the human side in both angles, both in terms of the people that did the hardest part of the lift, the actual founders and early employees, realize their vision, but again, also seeing their customer's vision kind of coming to a moment of delight, like that intersection is like super fun. You know, That's awesome. Really rewarding. That's really, really cool. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean it's it's rewarding to uh to connect the dots in a way that somebody else hasn't thought of doing before and make something happen. Yeah. So, and I, I completely agree there. So um why Pittsburgh? Like of all the places you could settle, I, I know the Bay Area, Boston, I mean Japan arguably. Um mm -hmm. could could be um, you know, um Denmark. I mean, why why set up a, a venture fund here? I mean, it kind of helped that half my family's from here. Um, Fair enough. You know, so that might have been some slight homerism. <laughs> but what I think really helped about Pittsburgh is that, you know, they hadn't necessarily fully realized any of the previous bubbles. You know, so like if you look at the Bay Area, like I think one of the things that actually sort of held back robotics in the Bay Area was that uh, success expectations, costs, et cetera, had already skyrocketed from internet tech, apps, like all the various things the Bay Area were good at. So when you look at hardware heavy and manufacturing heavy companies, it's really hard to do that in a place where 90, it's 92, you know, $94 a square foot for rent. Uh, and, you know, $200,000 is the starting salary, right? Like that, that's just, it just increases the level of difficulty. Um, your nut is through the roof. Yeah. I mean, say, same with, you know, some of the other East coast hotspots like New York and Boston, like, yeah. uh, not cheap places to start businesses. There were very established in industries in, uh, in Boston, you know, the mechatronics case and biotech case in New York, FinTech and other things. Yeah. FinTech for sure. Yeah. And then you look at Pittsburgh and you have, I mean, slight, as a Carnegie Mellon grad, but like I'm saying to you, you know, <laughs> the, the biggest and best robotics institute in the planet. Yep. Correct. Doing a form of robotics that is harder Straight and more colored. different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, just have a picture right here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, doing a, a form and a type of robotics that's harder and more differentiated from what you see on the, on anywhere else on earth. So that combination of quality with addressing, um, hard problems, on one side, creates, I think, a tremendous quality bubble. 
And on the other side, I mean, you know, the, the city has done a great job recovering from the collapse of steel, but you know, there's been no Silicon Valley boom. Uh, commercial real estate here is not $95 a square foot or yeah. 94 or whatever. It's been going it up. You know, it's, it, well, it was going up and then it's going down and like, but still it's quite reasonable in comparison Correct. to even yeah, like, let's agree. say, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina. So you have a very low uh, cost of doing business, a very high, you know, quality of individual and, you know, a culture, I think dating back to the steel days and even before that of actually, you know, as Arne- Andrew Carnegie said, you know, the joy is in the work. Yeah. So you have a lot of people here that enjoy what, you know, they're doing, uh, are very good at what they're doing. It doesn't cost them a bunch to do it. And I think that's a very good intersection for starting businesses. Because when you look, especially what we like to do, which are things that are not easy, that are uh, challenging to bring from product to market, it's a lot less challenging if the people are good aren't horribly expensive and aren't horribly entitled. And, you know, Pittsburgh, besides avoiding the negatives, has like the antonym to all those negatives. You know, very hardworking, enjoyable people, uh, expertise in things that are not trivial, and, you know, a willingness to take risks on, increasingly, on actually solving problems that matter. Sure. Not to mention inexpensive real estate. Yeah. 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 Yeah, great place to be. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I'm I'm a huge fan too. I, I think you put it really succinctly. I mean, those are a lot of my reasons for um, staying here and continuing to move back every time I leave Pittsburgh because it's it's a great place to run a business. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you have to feed the beast all the time, you know, I, I can only imagine trying to pay, you know, just for dinner in the Bay Area every night or yeah. you know rent let alone, you know, whatever. I mean, I try to keep operating costs as low as possible. Um, I mean, there's so many intelligent people that, you know, Carnegie Mellon, let's face it, creates. Yeah. And, um, I mean, you know, uh, Carnegie Mellon has been a great, you know, kind of seed crystal, but I feel like we've also gotten, you know, just from the startup community now, a bunch of people moving in from other places. I mean, we've got people moving here from Oregon, from Seattle, from the Bay Area, and well, I mean, part of it's people moving, but I think, a, you know, a bigger part or as big of a part is, I mean, I think the classic Pittsburgh problem for a very long time is we had smart people trained here, but they would get a job with the company, whether they, they were physically in Pittsburgh or not. That company was headquartered in Palo Alto or Boston or New York, and this was a satellite branch. So, you know... You'd have a bunch of engineers, maybe one business guy, and that's it. Yeah. Um, but no marketing people in Pittsburgh because that office was either in San Francisco or New York. You know, uh, your sales office may be here, but most likely distributed. So there wasn't that impetus to, you know, retain the full spectrum of talent you need to actually have companies. Because, of course, engineering helps, but if you can build it's a great product the puzzle. and the engineers don't understand what the customers need or the engineers understand what the customers you know, need but then can't communicate to them that they've solved the problem, it's not a business. You're pissing right? into the wind. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you have this wonderful thing that sits on your shelf and then does nothing for the world. Yeah, correct. It's, right. It's fallacious. You know, right. So, you know, I think once people started sort of making that commitment to – whether it was a consulting firm like Maya or, um, you know, an app like Duolingo or whatever, once people started making the commitment that, hey, you know, we're not going to start a business and then go where we think we can find more capital, we're going to start a business and then we're going we're to keep it here. I think that was a big difference for the local ecosystem because now, you know, our recruiting efforts in Pittsburgh are just as competitive with our recruiting efforts in San Francisco, not just for technical talent, but for marketing talent or sales talent or operating talent. Hence why people are relocating here. Yeah. You know, so you, you sort of actually can fully staff a business here, which I, I, I think is really something new as of the last decade. Yeah. 
It's been interesting to see. I uh, I was talking to my dad the other day, who's uh, you know, God right. bless the old boomer. You know, he's a good yep. dude. And um, he was. Uh, I was. I think I was having lunch in Lawrenceville, and I, I just told him like, "Hey, I got to go. I'm, I'm I'm Butler Street. I'm gonna have lunch." And he's like, is, "Is Lawrenceville still a really dangerous place to be?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> it's like the nicest neighborhood in Pittsburgh." Yeah. You know, it's super, super gentrified. I mean, I know it's, it's, uh, I mean, you know, one of my kids goes to school in Lawrenceville. Nice. Um, that's where our office was right before COVID and where it probably will be once we return, you know, go back to in-person work. But like at the time, which we met at, 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 at NREC, I mean, there were two places to eat in Lawrenceville, ham bones and industry. Kaleidoscope. <laughs> oh, no, and Kaleidoscope Cafe. They, uh. they, they were late to the game. They, they were like the third. Um, nice. You know, and I, re- I remember like it's like, do you want hand bones? Do you want industry? And like, I like both. Was industry like, not a chain back then? Was that like the first one? Yeah. Well, it used to only be like the front room of the current industry. Interesting. Yeah, it's, so now it's the chain. There's a bunch of them, right? Well, I think. I there's thought. what is it? Two or three? Yeah. Okay, fair I enough. think they're a I chain th- chain, but well, no. So the, the one in Lawrenceville, I know, got a lot bigger because they bought the building next to them, and now there's like four times the space. Yeah, but they managed to, to pack it in still. Like people. Yeah. People fill the space. And there's the one out in Robinson, and I think there's another one. I think there's a third one somewhere. So they, I mean, they've kind of syndicated, but, like, it seems kind of, they, they've sort of spread their wings as, like, now, like, everything on Butler Street is a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Totally. Yeah, I completely um, agree. You, you know, got, I mean, you got Red Fish Bowl Art Studio, too. <laughs> well, no, and, and there's still Arsenal Bowling and yeah. uh, Kickback Pinball Cafe, which is still one of my favorite places in Lawrenceville. That's awesome. Um, Have you I, been to Tonic Coffee yet? Or I guess it's now it's got a different name, Tulv. Is that the one by New Amsterdam? Uh, I think it's across from, um, uh, it's by the Doughboy statue. Oh, I, yeah, I go to that, that far down less frequently. Yeah, it's cool. James Turncheck from Format, it's like his favorite place. Every time I get coffee with him, he wants to go there. And yeah. there are these two women... Uh, Stephanie and Kiara who run the place, they're super friendly, but you can get like a cocktail made with coffee. It's like uh, hmm. if you want a fancy drink, but you don't want booze at 10 a.m., you can go to Tonic and nice. get, yeah. <laughs> Not, I actually don't think I've tried that. Like, I think you dig it. I, I, sounds like it would. I, I, you know, it used to be that from my office, you know, between 40th and 43rd Street, I could, using that new sort of riverfront hiking trail, very easily without having to walk not oh, on the trees get to espresso on mono nice so i still which i never use and i really need to actually keep this in my car i still have my reusable espresso amano <laughs> cappuccino cup nice um you know that 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 was my favorite coffee place in in um lawrenceville i've been going so to was. inkwell a lot in lawrenceville lately but espresso amano i like that they're actually open at seven so you can get an earlier meeting there yeah, yeah. you know um no, they're open early. I think I think they have the best coffee in that part yeah, of the town. You're supposed to be as a coffee place. Like, there's coffee places now that open at 10. I'm like, what's, hey, what's the point? What the fuck is that? Well, yeah. uh, but I mean, technically, from the pharmacological or whatever you want to call it approach, you should wait the 10 to have coffee. Probably. You know, but um, by then I've already had, you know, something else like a caffeine pill or a coffee or a Red Bull. I, I, you know, I've or been, nothing. If I got enough sleep the night before, I, I skip it. You know, it just depends I, how much sleep I get. I've been trying to wait until nine thirty or ten, now, and I, I've been doing uh, this for like two to three years now. And it's actually worked because apparently, if you have caffeine, and this is a paraphrase of medical research I read like seven years ago and barely remember, um, if you have caffeine too early in the morning, it blunts the natural chemicals that wake you up. Oh, that's interesting. Like it fills in for them. But if you wait for them to peak and then have caffeine, again, paraphrase, um, you actually, it actually adds alertness but doesn't decrease your body's wake-up impulse. Clever. And for most people, that's 9, 30, or 10 a.m. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, yeah, I've, I've done this for like, yeah, three years now. It actually really works. Like I find if I have coffee before 9 a.m., I get tired sooner. Interesting. But if I don't have coffee until 9.30 or 10 or 11, like I actually wake up naturally and then stay alert longer. That seems nice. I, so my approach, so, like I said, I mean, if I if I get less than seven hours of sleep the night before, then I'm probably going to have caffeine in some form or another. If I get more than seven hours of sleep or maybe more than eight, I'll say, um, I'm going to skip it just yeah. the whole day. I won't have it just to kind of build up my ability to fend for myself. Yeah. So I, I look at it as a as a sleep substitute. 
<laughs> Maybe that's not I think that is the good and the bad. Yeah. It will be that. If you could avoid it, it's better, but yeah. it will be that if you need it. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of it. But I try to always get more sleep, but then, you know, I mean, my work schedule comes in. Yeah. I'm out till midnight podcasting, and I got to be up at 5 a.m. the next morning, and you yeah. know, something's got to give. Hopefully hopefully not up to midnight podcasting. Night. Yeah. Got a, got a slightly earlier start. So, um, no, I know what you mean, though. I mean, we... we yeah. Thankfully, get a deal with people on, you know, multiple continents and multiple countries and uh, time buddy, especially has become the most used app on my phone. So I don't horribly botch conversions. Um, I should get time buddy. I, again, like I feel like collectively we should get tons of like, you know, perks from all these businesses. time buddy is sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> all, all these various businesses and apps we're plugging for free. Uh, if you're looking for a way to keep time zone straight, <laughs> check out time buddy. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, you know, I know what I mean like there's some days where I have like, you know, nothing until 10 a.m., but I have phone calls at 1 a.m. Um, so certainly, you know, the right kind of coffee and the right kind of sleep help, but gotten to a point where like I sleep six hours, no more, no less. Nice. And well, sorry, plus or minus 30 minutes. Yeah. And as long as that happens, I'm fine. And that rare, I, you know, rarely need more, rarely need less. Or rarely forced to take less. It would be so. nice to stabilize like that. That sounds awesome. I, like last week, I did five hours pretty much every night. And then I just slept all day Sunday. Yeah. Like I just did not, I did not get out of bed. Except for maybe like half an hour to watch cartoons. And then I went back <laughs> to bed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- th- you know, thankfully, like, I, I haven't had to do that recently. Yeah. Uh, I was never good at that. I've yeah. not pulled all nighters recently. That's yeah. something I gave up. Um, maybe you know, two years ago. I think I gave that up in college. Yeah, <laughs> I've pulled maybe like five hundred, and I luckily I'm not doing it anymore. We'll see what happens when uh, this next round of projects yeah. kicks off. But I think I, I think I'm gonna stay away. You know, it seems like a bad health decision. Well, I mean, the nice part about not really typically going to bed until two a.m. is that you don't really have too much pressure to do an all nighter because everyone else has fallen asleep before you, which so, means you can get shit done. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, no, that's I honestly, my most productive time is when other people aren't, uh, awake or yeah. doing business. So the weekend I, I do great work on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, the night, the morning, if I wake up at 4 AM and I just start knocking things out, I can, I can take care of invoicing for the week or yeah. I can, <laughs> I can I know that goes. do all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I've been trying to get better at doing the gym in the morning. I don't know if you've got a routine around that, but I just hired, like I said, a lot of diamonds trainer. So no. Allie Wetzel, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, uh, I, I mean, even dating back to where, like when I played sports competitively, like I could never do morning workouts. Um, they would just make me overly hungry and irritable the entire day. So, I mean, now like enjoy the, early evening, late afternoon rock climb or, you know, gym time or whatever. But I, I was always like dating back to even like when I was like 12, <laughs> horrible at working out in the morning. Cause it was just like, I hadn't eaten enough. Um, it just, it would just make me mad. Oh, I hate it. I, 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 I think I'm visibly angry in my training sessions lately, <laughs> but I guess I like, maybe I'm a little bit of a masochist. Like I just like seeing how far I can push my own, limits of physical endurance. So oh, that's, I, I am perfectly fine with that yeah. after I have appropriately eaten, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, had at least one, one coffee in the day. And, uh, yeah, at that point, like when Fred Fort, yes, I will push whatever limits I can do happily. You know, yeah, that's a good point. I don't think I could do it without like a trainer, you know, like pressuring me, like if it were me on my own, I, I just wouldn't do it. I'm trying to go with one of my buddies from Astrobotic. Um, and we're trying to get, you know, a couple of days at a send point breeze, you know, at their mm. gym in the morning uh, going. And we're scheduling these things at like six or seven. And, you know, we'll see how long that lasts. Are they open that early? Yeah, they open at six. Not really. Yeah. I don't know if the South Side one does, too. It probably does. Well, so, I mean, again, like I, I like going to both of those after the kids get out of school and we can all go together. And again, I've had two meals and appropriate, you know, hydration. Um I have never attempted to do that in the morning, so I have no idea when they're when they're actually open. Yeah, I was going with my one buddy um, who works at Meta now um, 
early mornings for a while. Yeah, they're open at six. No. Oh. One time we got wow. there, it was like a snowstorm, and we got there right at six. No, no, no. It was at seven. It was an hour after they were open, and there was nobody there because everybody yeah. was like, "Fuck this! It's snowing. We're not <laughs> going to come in." And uh, me and my buddy showed up, and they're like, "Ah, oh, great! Now we got to keep working." You know. Right. <laughs> they weren't. They weren't mean about it, but it was. It was just kind of fun being the only people in a in an entire climbing gym. Yeah. So that was that was sort of enjoyable. But you also can get early in the afternoon without having to wake up that early. Anyway, nice. Um, no, it, it's. I should try it more. I don't think one way is better than the other. Like I was a night owl no. all through grad school and most of my career. I, I used to say my peak hours are around two a.m. and because yeah. they were, yeah, I would get my right. stride around midnight. I would start peaking at two. I would maybe fold down at like five or six, and then I would sleep in. Yeah. Um, just for a change of flavor, I'm trying this for a little bit just to kind of see no, how it I, I how it think tickles it's me. Entirely like individuals, right? I mean, like I learned yeah. very early and often that um, I am not a morning exercise person. Yeah, but I mean, like I know plenty of people that love their 6 a.m. runs or whatever, and like oh, I don't love that, it. Right, make no work. mistake, Chris. Well, like I, okay. I, I am yeah. very much fighting my own desire to sleep in and not do anything. Yeah. But I'm trying, God damn it. And it feels good to be able to, you know, to kind of see that I'm malleable in the brain. So right. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the, the exercise, really. I, I have other ways to practice being malleable in the brain. Um, <laughs> work in the morning is not one of them. <laughs> nice. You know, so anyway. No, nah, it's, it's all good. I mean, yeah. So um, I think both of us kind of bonded over world travel quite a lot. Um, and this might be a teeny bit off topic, so sorry if this is boring to you, but what are some of the cooler places you visited and where do you want to go next? Um, hmm. It's a good question. I mean, growing up, my goal was to see all of North America before I started trying to venture further. And, you know, really enjoyed, especially in the summers in high school and college and shortly thereafter, going to Central America, you know, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, and uh, Guatemala and Belize especially. Nice. Uh, Want to take, you know, my kids back there now that they're enough to appreciate it. So that's sort of like almost like a, you know, going back to my basics so I can share it with my family. Awesome. Uh, and just love those cultures. So, um Obviously, that's one. And then for, like, more non-work travel, I've really enjoyed alternating trips between, again, business trips, also vacations to Australia, and personal trips to Iceland. Because, like, both of those places are places, like, I really want to just keep going back until I've seen, like, I've, like, you know, been completionist and, like, covered the entire island on the scratch off map, like... <laughs> Um, what is that though? The cartographer's dilemma where the deeper you go, the more paths you find to explore. Yeah. The more detail you got to map. That's well, that's one of the things like, yeah. you know, whether you go to an interesting place for business and I mean, certainly, you know, uh, you know, uh, Switzerland and Germany and Italy were, I love Switzerland. Um, all part, all, all these for various reasons. Like when you go and you're like, man, I didn't actually see enough. And I want to come back like immediately. That's the sign you did it. You, you know, you pick somewhere well. And, um, you know, thanks to a coworker or friend, um, got to see the western part of Australia for the first time. Would that be Michael? Well, Michael indirectly, but uh, someone you haven't met yet, uh, one of our uh, colleagues, Ian. Cool. He has a place in the very far west of Australia in the Kimberley Plateau that, you know, he invited us and the kids and Michael too to come out and you know see and I have never been more than 30 minutes from the east coast of Australia before and it's like an entirely different planet nice um so tremendous culture tremendous people tremendous history like you know the kids got to see a dinosaur footprint <laughs> like not That's like awesome. in a museum just like out there like rain like hey you know we're off the sidewalk. There's a dinosaur footprint, like you know, just in the concrete. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> uh, in a in a rock that's been there for ever. That's so cool. Um, and definitely want to see more of that. You know, uh, took the family to Iceland this summer just for a very quick vacation because it's actually really easy to get to from Pittsburgh. Again, please bring back Wow Air. I guess it's Play Air now, but. 
Play Air does not have a flight from it's Pittsburgh. Called Play Air. It's called Play Air. That's hilarious. Um, and it's built on this. <laughs> well, I, I guess you know. I mean, Wow was an airline that was tremendous for Iceland, but sure, really bad at pricing flights, <laughs> which I guess was why they don't exist anymore. So for our 12th anniversary, we went to Iceland, and like it was like 130 bucks round trip per person, which is literally less than going to Florida. And you know, it was four and a half hour flights. Like you'd see the Northern Lights from the plane. Like cool, that was fantastic. But like, it's very clear that you cannot sustainably run an airline flying transatlantic for 130 bucks, which in retrospect they couldn't. So yeah, I guess they brought it back as Play Air recently but unlike wow which had a direct flight from pittsburgh to Reykjavik, which was again fantastic awesome well no, like i mean like we even used it to get to europe because like it was 99 bucks well that's what you would do is you would springboard and then like ryanair or whatever to well, the next no one. i mean because because wow had 99 to i think 150 flights from various u.s cities to Reykjavik, but then 79 dollar flights from Reykjavik to basically any major Seriously? city in europe yeah so like I, it's I actually, like cheaper than going to Texas. Well, I, I I flew um, to Scotland on a business trip to see some essentially really cool sustainable technology we try to bring back to Pittsburgh, and the round trip was one seventy, connecting through Reykjavik. Awesome. And again, that's why the airline doesn't exist. But Play Airlines exists, which is supposed to be the reboot. So hopefully they get a Pittsburgh flight because uh, I miss that airline. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Let me um, know if it does. I'm not going to tell anyone because I, I would like to keep all the cheap seats myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you tell people, then they'll have the financing to continue as a company. That's true. Yeah. I mean, well, no, I think the problem with WOW was that too many people took the flights because they couldn't sustain They couldn't affordably fulfill. Oh, they were selling a loss or something? No. it's like, Yeah. It was like I think they were dependent upon um, government stipends because, of course, the government wanted to encourage tourism. So they would give WOW subsidies, and then WOW would charge a ridiculously small amount for a very long flight. Yeah. Um, and then eventually, like, they couldn't subsidize as much, so I think that's why the airline went bankrupt. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I guess if your business model is dependent on a subsidy, you can't get any more. Oh, well. Bottom falls out. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, that was a long-winded way to say I, I wish there was a Play Airlines flight to yeah. Pittsburgh while we are just blatantly plugging various businesses of that don't exist anymore <laughs> <laughs> well do and do not exist and may or not be local and whatever so i mean it's all good like we don't you know this isn't a commercial like this is a conversation so it was getting pretty close to a commercial for a while yeah. um whatever. I mean, you yeah. know it can it can delve into commercial and then yeah. there you go as long as you, you know you you delve your toes you dip your toes in the water you know you get yeah. out and go back in you know whatever we enjoy what we're doing yeah so the goal is to keep doing it yeah. You know, and the nice part about looking for people that are doing really hard things that matter to a group of people we haven't helped yet, because um, we're, again, very monogamous in our investments. So if we were to invest in a walking robot company that does logistics and maybe deliveries or whatever, we're not touching any of that aspect on another company, again, for a while, because you can't really help someone and their competitor. It's just interesting. It's just conflict I, of interest. Well, no, it's, I mean, you know, a lot of VCs do that, but I think it's, I mean, quite frankly, a bad practice because, you know, once you actually commit to a company, you want to commit to a company and you want to help them be successful until they're either going to succeed or not. And then, you know, gone from there. So because we try not to stay too close to where we've already invested, you know, it really, I think, for myself and the other partners, like makes it a lot of fun to work here because... By definition, the next thing we do is not something we've done. Yeah, can't in, term, be. in terms of technology, in terms of you know industry. So, because we've done a lot of really cool, really hard things in the past, I think we bring a lot of knowledge that, quite frankly, most people don't have the opportunity to accumulate. But we're bringing it in a totally new environment once we do something. So the learning on our part is also fantastic because again, we're bringing a lot with us, but then of course we're bringing it to a, at least from our perspective, a totally greenfield environment where it's, you know, 
fairly far afield to an existing investment we've done. So, you know, get it kind of dust off our old industry knowledge off the shelf and then apply it in a way that is something we haven't even remotely addressed previously. And I th that's, that's fun. Do you ever, and, and maybe this is, you know, too personal to ask, it's okay. But do you ever get your portfolio companies working together in a way, like consolidate resources, um, help each other out, maybe take something from over here? And I mean, we try to. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, I think, the other benefit of doing things that aren't, you know, near neighbors, right? Because when portfolio company A and portfolio company B might have something to share, I mean, there's not a lot of competition between the two. You yeah. know, if... Um, some software approach you've done on a travel software is helpful to a precision medicine company, for example, like it doesn't weaken either side to share. Yeah. It makes sense. So I think so far all of our various CEOs and CTOs, et cetera, have been very open talking to each other when helpful because you know, they're not sharing trade secrets with a competitor. Like they're, going at people that did something totally different and looking for ways to innovate that back into their environment and vice versa. So it creates a more trusting environment, we think. Cool. A few times where we've been able to do joint sales because one product is a very good tanner product to the other. So, you know. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's really, really cool. I hope so. That sounds like it. Again, you know, we've drunk enough Kool-Aid so far, so we're not, not trying try not to drink more, but, you know. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> making the world a better place <laughs> but uh yeah no the, um so i think probably at like a good natural stopping point yeah. if you uh if you want to cut it so people actually listen to this on their work commute yeah but uh chris pleasure coming having you on is there anything you want to plug on the way out no i think i mean we plugged several you several countries across the world the vast majority of butler street um <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think we've done enough plugging so far. All right. Well, pleasure, pleasure hanging yeah. out, Chris. Glad we finally did this. Yeah, me too. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.